feel like I'm a lounge singer. <laughs> so I can play the piano. You don't want to hear me sing. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you so much. What a what a great turnout tonight. Thank you very much for for coming out tonight. And uh, now I, I could be wrong, but I just from the sampling of the people I've met, I think there are more people here from Pennsylvania than South Carolina. <laughs> I could be wrong. I could be wrong. All right. Everybody that's in Pennsylvania, please just put up your hand. Come on. Ah, pretty close. Pretty close. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for coming out and uh, and showing the uh, the Keystone State flag for us here in uh, in South Carolina. It's great to be here. Uh, let me uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Sandy McGarry for uh, for help and support. She was kind enough today to uh, to be the first county chairman in South Carolina. To, uh, to endorse me for president. So I just want to thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, there's still a chance to be the first state representative to endorse me in South Carolina. Just want to make that, and, and Sheriff, we need you to switch parties first, but, which, which would be a good thing. And then you could be the first sheriff to endorse me in South Carolina. So, how about that? So, thank you both for, for being here tonight. I'm honored that you took the time to come and, and to be with us here tonight. And um, I, I'm just, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm debating here whether to, to give much of a speech tonight because I know people have a lot of questions. And you just saw the debate uh, last night. How many, how many, by the way, how many people watched the debate at any point in time? Okay. Pretty good, most of it, that's really good. Uh, let me, before I, before I say anything else, let me introduce the most important person who's here with me tonight. And uh, that is uh, my daughter, Elizabeth. Elizabeth is uh, the oldest of our seven children. And, you know, imagine the oldest of seven, imagine what she's like, that's exactly what she's like. She is, she's, she is an absolute leader. And uh, we, she was kind enough to, uh, with our, our oldest, Elizabeth is 20, then we have 18, uh, 16, 13, 11, 10, and 3. Okay? So, so we uh, had one wife. Just want to make sure that there is the gap, if you have a question. So, 21 years, uh, Karen and I have been married, and very, very blessed uh, to, uh, to have those uh, seven wonderful children. And Elizabeth uh, was kind enough a, a few weeks, right after the game straw poll, which we did much better than anybody expected us to do. Um, uh, people said, well, you finished fourth. I remember walking, after the results were, were announced uh, at, up at Iowa State, I walked by the MSNBC booth, uh, and Mike McCarthy was one of the analysts that was, was doing an interview, and he came up to me and said, well, I just gave an interview as to why fourth place was great and third place was lousy. And, and fourth place, I finished fourth, but the guy that finished third, Tim Pawlenty, spent over a million dollars, almost $2 million in the lead up to that, to that uh, uh, straw poll, ran four plus weeks of television, did direct mail, phone calls, Bachman did the same thing, Ron Paul did the same thing. All three candidates spent an enormous amount of money. I spent less than $100,000 and I came within a few hundred votes. And so the media doesn't report that. They just said, oh, he finished fourth, he didn't do well. Uh, we finished fourth and the people of Iowa know we did darn well. And, and so we're, we're building great support out there in Iowa. And, and Karen, the reason was Karen and the kids, we packed up and for three weeks moved to Iowa. And uh, I went out and did 50 town hall meetings uh, in 15 days. Uh, went out and, and really started a grassroots effort and also the debate in Ames. Uh, most people thought we did very, very well. And for a lot of folks, I was the first time they'd seen me. And the reason was is because, and we've talked about this with a few people as we've walked around. The national media is trying to tell you who to pick for president. You have eight folks that are running, but as far as the media is concerned, there's two. Now, uh, here's, here's the interesting thing. Two weeks before Ames, all of the pundits, how many people here watch Fox News? I bet you one or two. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you wouldn't be here if you didn't watch Fox News. <laughs> so let's look at the real smart people at Fox News. Smart people like Bill Crystal and Fred Barnes and Paul and Charles Crowder. All of them, all of them, two weeks before the straw poll said, oh, well, actually about a month before the straw poll. It's a two-person race. It's Palenti and Romney, Palenti and Romney. And then two weeks before the straw poll, it's a three-person race, Palenti, Bachman, and Romney. 
And then after the straw poll, it's a three-person race. It's, it's Bachman, Perry, and Romney. Then two weeks later, oh, it's a two-person race. It's Perry and, and, and Romney. Now, in a two-month period of time, they've got it wrong three times. What makes you think they're the experts? What they're doing is they're, they're sheep. They sit in Washington, D.C. They have no idea what's going on here on the ground because they don't come. They don't talk to anybody out here. They have no idea what the campaigns are really up to. And, and they're, listen, they're looking at something that is completely irrelevant to who is elected president. And you know what the most irrelevant statistic is as to who will be nominated president of the United States? A national poll. It means nothing. But it's the only thing that the media gloms onto and says, well, they're high in the national polls. Well, why are they high in the national polls? Because that's who the media talks about. They talk about Romney and Pawlenty, and guess what? Romney and Pawlenty are at the top. They stop talking about Bachman. Why? What happened? Her numbers just cratered. Why? Because the media has told you the race is between Romney and Pawlenty. And so they become like sheep, and then you become like sheep. It's really a fascinating thing. I, I, you know, I've never run for president. So this is a new experience. And it's just been really fascinating to see how this, this dynamic evolves. Here's the interesting thing. Four years ago, you know who the top two people in the polls? And they said it was a race between these two people. They were well ahead in the polls. Rudy Giuliani and Fred Thompson. Neither of whom won a single delegate. But they were, that's who the race was. And all these other folks were just, they should get out of the race because it's, it's not, they, they can't win. So just remind, Mike Huckabee at this point in time in the race was at 3% in the national poll. So I want to share that with you because you have to keep your eye on the ball. And the ball is eight people, not two. And what you saw last night was, hope was I believe, one of the first debates where they sort of let everybody play. The debate before MSNBC decided this was going to be the Rick and Mitch show. The wrong Rick, in my opinion, but nevertheless. <laughs> uh, and, and so what you're going to see here, I think, develop, is uh, I'm hopeful you're going to start to see a little bit more participation because I can tell you as one campaign, we are screaming and hollering that it's not their, they don't have the right to decide who is going to be the nominee of this party. And I will tell you, I hate to say this, the worst offender is Fox. The worst offender is Fox. They have done more than any other any other station to limit the, the race. I don't know if it's because they have limited reporter resources, which by the way they do vis-a-vis -vis the other networks. They don't have nearly the number of reporters. And so it's actually better for them if it's a race between two candidates, because they can cover two campaigns. CNN and MSNBC have N N NBC reporters as well as CNN has a huge news staff, and so they can have reporters in all the campaigns. Fox doesn't do it though. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic with, with the way it's played out. And I just, I thought I would share that with you because I get this question all the time about you know, how this campaign and how these debates have developed. So I, I thought I'd share that with you. Uh, let me just uh, make one other point and then we'll leave most of the time for questions. I happen to believe this is the most important election in your lifetime, and I don't care how old you are. Uh, because this election, is a turning point election in American history. And, and I say that uh, as someone who has seven children, ages 20 to three, who should not be out spending six, seven days a week running around the country running for president. And un under normal circumstances, there's no way I'd be doing that. But I believe this is an election that is gonna change the future of this country and the kind of country my children will live in. And as a father, I have a responsibility to protect my children. And if my children are living in a country that is less free, less prosperous, prosperous, and less safe, demonstrably so on all fronts, then I will have abdicated my responsibility, my basic responsibility as a father. And so I do so not because, I know there may be some people out here, but not because there were throngs of people saying, Rick, run for president, okay? There was no chorus of folks and, and groundswell across the country you know, clamoring for me to be a presidential candidate. I did because I was someone who had been involved in public life for 16 years in the House and the Senate. Someone who's watched what went on in Washington and watched what's gone on in this country, been an observer and been a participant. And I couldn't sit on the sidelines and let this election pass with the people